On the 10th of May in 1947, the communist authorities in the newly founded People's Republic of Bulgaria began the construction of Dimitrovgrad, a brand new town modeled on socialist principles that would herald the dawn of a new political era. Over the next several years, thousands of young volunteers would build the city and its nearby industrial plants, designed along utopian lines both to convince their nation's populations of the superiority of the new system and to provide the industrial capacity to make the socialist dream reality. Dimitrovgrad was soon followed by Eisenhutenstadt in East Germany, Dunajvaros in Hungary, Poruba in Czechoslovakia, and Nova Huta in Poland. And soon, nearly every Eastern Bloc nation was building a brand new socialist city. Today, we will explore the history and planning of these communist new cities. At the conclusion of World War II, the USSR's new Eastern European partner states faced two pressing needs shifting the nation's economies from a free market to a centrally planned model focused on heavy industry, and transforming their populations from largely rural villagers into urbanized proletarian workers. The new city, an industrial town built from scratch in every Eastern Bloc nation outside the Soviet Union, aimed to address both points. The first of these cities, Bulgaria's Dimitrovgrad, was centered around a massive new chemical plant, while Eisenhutenstadt in East Germany, Nova Huta in Poland, and Dunajvaros in Hungary housed the workers of new steel mills, the largest in each country. In fact, steel was so central to these cities that they were often named after it. Eisenhutenstadt literally means ironworks city, while Nova Huta translates as new ironworks. The cities were monumental in scale. Both Dunajvaros and Eisenhutenstadt had an original planned population of 30,000, while Nova Huta was built for a hundred thousand residents, with nearly half to be workers in the steel mill. Czechoslovakia's Poruba, which also housed a peak population of about a hundred thousand, hosted a major technical university that would train skilled workers for industry elsewhere. New cities, it was hoped, would secure the economic prosperity of their nations. However, the ideological function of the new city was even more important. As art historian Anders Amann describes in his book Architecture and Ideology in Eastern Europe during the Stalin Era, quote, new cities were a glimpse of tomorrow's reality, unquote. A sort of model home the governments could show off as a demonstration of the good life socialism would bring. In existing cities, socialist planning could only ever be imposed on top of pre-socialist built environments, a process of evolution. In contrast, the new cities, built from scratch and populated by workers from all around the country, were revolutionary. As Amman puts it, in these towns, quote, there were no links with the old society." Unquote. He also describes the design of new cities as a quote, mirror of the political order, unquote. Just as the economy would now be rationally and centrally planned, cities would be rationally designed from scratch. The planned allocation of schools, nurseries, libraries, and cultural centers demonstrated the socialist commitment to prioritizing, quote, concern for mankind, unquote, in place of competition and the profit motive. Hence, new cities were both a pragmatic and an aesthetic project. Writing about Bulgaria's Dimitrovgrad, a contemporary author described the city as, quote, one great work of art, saturated with the abundant ideological content of the epoch, unquote. These ideological functions were built into each city's design. Amman identifies several common features of their planning. New cities were centered on a central tree-lined boulevard, like Hlavny Boulevard in Poruba or Strasse der Republik in Eisenhutenstadt. Main streets had shops at street level and were flanked by apartments several stories tall, and terminated at a large, open central plaza. 
which hosted the city's administration to highlight the Communist Party's central position in political life. But there were few really major roads, and across most of the city, apartments formed large, hollow blocks which contained playgrounds and schools, mirroring the microrayon model that would be commonly replicated across the cities of the Eastern Bloc. In Poruba, it is possible to cross the entire city through these pedestrianized courtyards, only occasionally crossing a road open to traffic. These green courtyards contrast with the central plaza of the city, which was designed to host political demonstrations and parades. Some elements, like the Khrushchevka-style housing blocks or the placement of main streets at 45-degree angles, are Soviet imports, but the new cities were not merely cookie-cutter Russian duplicates. In a 2005 paper, historian Mark Pitaway highlights that, quote, Soviet models were certainly important, but they interacted with local circumstances to produce the city's unique form, unquote, as seen in each city's dramatically different layout. The integration of nature was also very deliberate. Unlike earlier Soviet industrial cities like Magnitogorsk, which placed housing right next to factories, a large green buffer now separated the industrial plant from residential areas. To get to work at the Dunajvaro steel mill, for example, residents of Hungary's new city would hike nearly a kilometer along trails passing through a forest meant to insulate the city from industrial pollution. New cities also typically bordered a large nature park. The Nova Huta Meadow is today home to many rare animal and plant species, while the northern edge of Dimitrovgrad borders a sprawling green zone. The city itself was meant to be far from pastoral, however, even though plenty of green space was present within them. The urban boundary was clearly defined and sprawl was strictly limited, at least initially. In Dimitrovgrad, there were even plans to build city gates to clearly segregate city and country. In fact, according to Aman, new cities, quote, were planned in deliberate contradistinction, unquote, to Western sprawl. While Scandinavia, the UK, and America went all in on suburban development, Soviet new cities would remain strictly urban in character. In the words of Pitaway, quote, the new city was planned in such a way as to achieve unity between village, factory, city, and natural landscape, unquote, rather than the city simply sprawling endlessly into nature. Beyond the green belt of the new city lay the industrial plant. Like the city itself, the industrial zone would be designed with ideological as well as practical concerns in mind. Pitaway describes new cities as, quote, organized around the twin poles of politics and production, unquote, with the factory and city composing contrasting and yet complementary units of a complete whole. In fact, one of the planners of Dunajvaro stated that, quote, the socialist city and the socialist industrial site are two poles of one unified unit. The city center and the main gate of the factory must lie in direct line from one another." Unquote. To emphasize this, the entrance to the Dunajvaro steel mill was marked with a monumental gate which emphasized the separation of the city and factory, even as the city's central avenue, which connected it to the steel mill, suggested their unity. At Dunajvaros, Nova Huta, and Eisenhutenstadt, that avenue connected to the city's steel mill and hence economic center at one end, and the central plaza and hence the political center at the other end. The scale of operations was extraordinary, with the ironworks at Nova Huta producing more steel than all of Poland combined before the war, a scale necessary to build socialism and rebuild a country ruined during the war. The industrial plant typically provided an array of social services as well. For example, the Nova Huta steel mill ran its own newspaper, movie theater, sports club, and daycare for its workers. Even as town and industry were kept physically separate, their relative design suggested a unity between political and economic, 
a unity central to Marxist thought. Architecturally, new cities conformed to the Soviet aesthetic doctrine of socialist realism, which we briefly described last time. As described by anthropologist Kinga Pozniak in her book Nova Huta, Generations of Change in a Model Socialist Town, new city architecture followed the maxim socialist in content, national in form. In practice, this meant that architecture was expected to conform to the socialist realist model, namely an emphasis on neoclassical elements like columns and arches and a preference for the monumental. However, variation in the details to conform to local character was allowed and even encouraged. A Baroque tower attached to Poroba's dramatic, semicircular, and otherwise neoclassical entrance reflects the architecture of Prague, while the more austere, modern appearance of Eisenhutenstadt's residential blocks takes inspiration from the German Bauhaus movement. In Dunajvaros, the mural above the steel mill entrance was inspired by Hungarian folk art, while the crenellations on Nova Huta's administrative center were copied from nearby Krakow's old town. In any case, the buildings at the city's political core and along its main boulevards were the most richly decorated, with planar designs prevailing further out. But socialist realism was not uniformly present. The very first neighborhoods in both Dimitrovgrad and Nova Huta were built in a more pastoral style, with smaller, detached buildings, while developments in the 60s and 70s in many new cities took on more modern forms. For example, while the core of Poroba remains intact, it is surrounded by neighborhoods of both single-family homes and late Soviet high-rises. Building the new cities took a tremendous amount of manpower, by 1952, for example, Dunajvaros hosted over 14,000 construction workers. To attract such a monumental workforce, never mind the new population, Pozniak describes how each new city was depicted in national propaganda, quote, as a town of youth and opportunity, a place where young people from all over the country came to escape supposed backwardness and misery of peasant life, to work, get an education, start families, and build their lives." Unquote. A widely distributed propaganda newsreel about Nova Huta from 1951 is an excellent example of this messaging. The reel begins by contrasting the backwardness of the countryside where Nova Huta was being built. Wieś pod Krakowem, jedna z wielu, w tych chalupach bandowski glut drwił z ludzkiego poniżenia. Z takich wsi Bieda gnala na gorzką tulaczkę za chlebem. It then shows off the exciting life in the makeshift worker barracks on site before demonstrating the construction itself. New cities weren't just a job opportunity, but a place to get a practical education and become a skilled worker. Kuźnią nowych kadr staje się sama budowa. 7000 ludzi zdobyło tu pełne zawodowe kwalifikacje. Każdy wykop jest egzaminem. Każdy mur jest cennym doświadczeniem. Practical work was often supplemented with theoretical coursework after hours. Kiedy junak Czesław Zdziach przyjechał do Nowej Huty, nie umiał nawet czytać i pisać. Wszyscy uczymy się zawodu. Teoria jest nieodłączna od praktyki. Sala wykładowa uzupełnia szkole rusztowań. The newsreel concludes with a demonstration of family and child life in the new city highlighting the well-provisioned schools and nurseries, large parks, and spacious family apartments. To piękne miasto zapowiada dni, dla których warto jest ofiarnie pracować. Przyszłość, dla której warto jest żyć. Pozniak claims that a major purpose of the new cities was to demonstrate, quote, how socialist ideas were made concrete in a real place and in real people's lives, unquote. At first, they seem to have made a good impression, though this would not last. According to Pozniak, the new cities were built under, quote, a strong structuralist belief that social and living conditions create the individual, his or her personality, and value system, unquote. It was hoped that life in the new cities would transform peasants into skilled, civilized, and socialist proletarians, as portrayed in that newsreel. But this was not always the case. 
Residents of Novakuta's neighbor city, Krakow, quote, were repulsed by stories of uncultured peasants who kept coal or firewood in their bathtubs and livestock in their apartments, unquote, in the new city, while, as reported by historian Sandor Horvath, a local Dunaivaros newspaper complained that residents, quote, chopped wood in their flats, dumped their rubbish out of their window or accumulated it in the cellar, kept animals in their bathrooms, regularly went to the local pub, and, instead of using the city's shops, bought on the black market." Unquote. New cities were deliberately built without private backyards to prevent new residents from bringing along their farm animals, apparently to no avail. Horvath reports that one district in Dunaivaros tried and failed to ban the keeping of pigs three separate times, with residents using communal washrooms as makeshift slaughterhouses. Ironically for these model towns, new cities often became hubs of political resistance. Dunaivaros became a hotbed of dissident thought by the Hungarian Spring of 1956, while Nova Huta became a stronghold of Poland's solidarity movement several decades later. Still, many of the new arrivals did find a happy life in the new cities. Of the tens of thousands of workers that built Nova Huta, about a third chose to settle there permanently rather than returning home. Almost as quickly as they had appeared, by the late 50s, the new cities vanished from official propaganda. Socialist realism had officially fallen out of fashion after the death of Stalin, and many new cities were downsized as national finances faced strain and heavy industry became less important. For example, both Nova Huta and Poruba were designed to eventually eclipse their neighbors, but by 1951 and 1957, respectively, they were downgraded to mere neighborhoods within Kraków and Ostrava. Pollution was also a chronic issue, and Nova Huta consistently had the worst air quality in the entire country thanks to the sheer scale of the steel mill. In all new cities, the well-organized original urban plans were disregarded as their district expanded, leaving an elegantly planned core surrounded by ad hoc suburbs. The historian Aman recalls his Hungarian travel agent calling Dunaivaros, quote, the ugliest town in the whole country, unquote. And when he consulted a Bulgarian architect on visiting Dimitrovgrad, he only got the response, quote, what on earth do you want to go there for, unquote. After the fall of communism, the local economy, once centered on the industrial plants, typically nosedived. Today, the Nova Huta steel mill employs less than 10% of the workers it did at its peak. Still, the legacy of the new cities is often viewed positively by locals. When Pozniak asked residents what they liked most about life in Nova Huta, they uniformly praised its urban planning, highlighting, quote, the proximity and availability of all essential infrastructure and services, unquote in contrast to both late Soviet and later capitalist developments. In spite of its early negative reputation, Nova Huta today houses nearly a quarter million people, more than twice the original plan. And appreciation for its urban plan has generally grown since the fall of socialism, as political connotations fade away and the city can be judged in its own right. In fact, it was proclaimed one of Europe's best neighborhoods by readers of The Guardian in 2020, thanks in part to its compact yet idyllic design. While the new cities never did live up to their promises, they still provide a shining example of how to build a better city. We should learn what we can from them. <laughs>